So thank you, Marie Debrim, interventional cardiologist from Montreal Heart Institute uh, in Canada. Um, so the, the sandwich technique, it's important, I think, to know to treat chicken wing appendage. This is uh, designed for, for that. Uh, the chicken wing appendage is presenting with an obvious bend uh, of the dominant lobe of the appendage at some distance of the ostium, you know that, and it's the most common morphology in clinical practice. So the chicken wing appendage orientation can be conventional, going inferior or down or reverse, pointing superior, sometimes that we can call anterior also. It can be anterior or posterior in the sagittal view also. Most importantly, chicken wing can, can, have, can present short neck. There's no clear definition of short neck, certainly less than one centimeter. Uh, this is important to know because this is a good anatomy for sandwich technique, probably not a good uh, anatomy for, for watchmen, for example. So a few important facts. Uh, most chicken wing appendage can be closed with a curing device on the market. However, in my experience, chicken wing anatomies are typically easier and better treated with the amulet. Uh, the, the disc is sealing well the orifice, no matter the anatomy behind. And there's more closure option with the amulet, including the sandwich technique. So this is an example of lack of good sealing. Uh, this, is, um, this is published. Uh, this is a reverse chicken wing, as you, as you can see uh, well. So they uh, describe here a failed uh, watchman, a uh, failed 2.5 uh, watchman. The largest device was, uh, to, was not large enough to cover the orifice and was too far in the appendage. So they removed that 2.5 device and they describe a successful fixed closure of the appendage. But despite what they call successful closure, there's a residual leak here that you can well appreciate on echo and a residual leak of the proximal portion on CT scan. So this is an example of significant protrusion. Uh, this is a whale tail chicken wing with a short depth. Uh, you see here well the anatomy. This is a case report uh, describing a successful closure with a 24 millimeter flex device. Uh, the, um, they, they got some simulation uh, from Feop. So Feops it's a startup company from Belgium providing nice simulation. This is a simulation of a 24 millimeter flex device, proximal location, more distal position. I think they used a more distal position, but despite that, they're reporting a successful closure, but there's a very significant protrusion of that device within the uh, left atrium. And this is an anatomy that is very easy to close with an amulet with a lobe inside here, the tail, and the disc covering the orifice. So for chicken wing anatomy with the amulet, my first choice is still what we call the classical implantation technique, where you put the lobe in the landing zone here in the neck, because you can oppose well both sides of your lobe on the wall of the appendage. For short, short neck appendage, I think the sandwich or the, what we call the semi-sandwich technique are also a good option, probably more as a backup uh, technique. For the sam I think the semi-sandwich technique is the second choice. So classical first in the chicken wing appendage. If it's, if it's too short, the neck, probably the second choice is the semi-sandwich because it maintains some stability of the device because one side of the device is fully opposed to the wall and the other side, at least it's supported by the shoulder of the uh, appendage. The true sandwich technique is probably the third and the last uh, resort in my mind, because you deploy the lobe fully in the wing of the appendage like this. It can be like the conventional chicken wing, the reverse chicken wing. And this is the case report that uh, Rod present just present, uh, uh, recently where the low, low was not big enough to fill uh, the, uh, the wing. So the device in that case can slide within the wing and you, you finish with a, with, a, with a significant gap that you can still close here with a vascular plug, but still the device can slide if it's not holding well within the anatomy. So if you do the true sandwich technique, you need to measure the wing of the appendage, you need to measure the length, you need to measure the width, the height should be uh, long enough for the lobe and the width should be uh, at least 7.5 millimeter for the smallest device 
and 10 millimeter for the largest one. Chicken morphology, we described uh, the, that technique long time ago. Actually, uh, Chevy was a fellow with us in Montreal at the time. It was in 2013. This is the anatomy that we treat at the time using the true sandwich technique. So this is a reverse chicken wing, short depth. Uh, this is the angiogram, delivery sheet, ball first, lobe fully open in the wing of the appendage, appendage then disc over the orifice. And this is the final result on this patient. So you have, again, the lobe fully open in the wing. One part of the lobe is not touching the, the wall, but the device is holding well in place because the lobe is fully open behind the bend of this appendage. So two short clinical case. First one, uh, 80 years old female uh, that we are closing for recurrent GI bleeding. You see on CT scan a very large and long appendage, a regular chicken wing, so pointing down, relatively short neck here. But I think the most important thing here to realize on CT scan is the proximity with the primary artery. So you see in different view that the uh, primary artery is huge. It's also very close to the neck of this appendage. It was 1.5 to 2 millimeter uh, uh, away from the, the neck of the appendage. So this is on 3D. This is very clear, large primary artery wrapping around this uh, neck of the appendage. So we measured the neck, uh, so the classical landing zone. Uh, the wing was significantly larger and longer. And because of the proximity of the primary artery, so see, you see, well, the neck, 24 millimeter, that's an option to deliver your device with using the classical method. But in this case, because the primary artery was just right next to this neck, we decided to go with a sandwich technique, delivering a much larger device, 34 millimeter device, so the lobe is fully open in the wing of the appendage behind the circumflex artery. And this is the final uh, position of this device. We are deploying now the disc. And this is the, the final, uh, uh, final device uh, on echo. See, we see closing very well this appendage. Uh, the neck, the classical neck of this appendage is more at this level. So I think if we felt that we were more safe, even if it's bigger device, using the sandwich technique for this anatomy. So this is a second case. This is a 67 male, male with, uh, that we are closing for cerebral amyloid angiopathy. This is the uh, segmentation provided by FAOPS. Uh, it's a very small appendage. It's reverse chicken wing. Landing zone was very small, no, no larger than 11 millimeter large. Uh, it's a short neck also. So as I said, uh, FAOPS, they're providing simulation. They, pro they, sim they provide a simulation of a 16 millimeter device, so the smallest amulet device placed proximally. They did not even provide the distal simulation. Uh, and see, even if it's a 16 millimeter, the smallest device is very compressed. Uh, having this, we decide to go with to go ahead, but to go ahead with the sandwich technique, just to have some chance at least to deploy uh, the lobe of the smallest device in this uh, wing. So we even use, in this case, the 18 millimeter device, you will see. So if you're closing an anatomy like this, you need to go very low. It was mentioned earlier today. You need to go also anterior to reach the appendage in a good axis. Uh, steerable sheet is useful. It's coming back soon uh, on, on the market. So this is the sheet now in place. I think we identify a nice wing here to deploy the lobe. We decide to go ahead with the 18 millimeter device. We were able to fully open the lobe within the wing. You can appreciate that. If you do that, I mean, you, you obtain a very stable position. And then we just deploy the disc over the orifice, ending up with a very good result and a very stable device. So this is the final result. Still very good on CT scan at follow-up. So take home message from my talk. I think the sandwich technique is a backup to treat chicken wing appendage. The amulet as a full sandwich or as a semi sandwich should be considered for short neck appendage. I think it's the technique of choice. And to avoid the neck of worrying anatomies, 
The sandwich wing is safe uh, when the wing is, the appendage is long and large enough, and this is well proved uh, now. This is a, a multi-center registry uh, under the leadership of uh, Chevy Frexa, where we publish that it's safe to use the, sa the sandwich technique to close appendage. Thank you very much for your attention. I'd like to thank uh, Abbott for organizing this wonderful meeting and conference. We just finished 250th Amulet last week, and despite two, doing 250 Amulets, I think I learned a lot from every single talk. So thanks again to uh, uh, Abbott for organizing this. So transeptal puncture, we have heard from uh, multiple presenters in the morning, in the afternoon, that why it is so important to have a good transeptal puncture which will lead to successful device placement. I'm sure you've seen this multiple times this morning, but I'll try to make it simple. I'm an interventional cardiologist. My brain thinks in a very simple way, as opposed to some of my EP colleagues. So there is point A and point B. Fossa valis is point A. Point B is the uh, appendage. So these anatomies are important, and they differ in every patient. So you have to take account of the fossa valis, which has been discussed very thoroughly in the, by the previous presenters. So basically, once you know fossa valis in that patient, and once you have had three-dimensional picture of appendage in your head for that particular patient, then you basically connect the dots. If you look uh, at the fossa from the right side of the CT scan image, and as you progress to the left side of the heart, then you see where the fossa valis ends up. The same fossa, we're just progressing the image coming from right atrium to the left atrium. And that's a relationship of mitral valve. You can see on the top there is a appendage. What if you obtain an inferior and anterior puncture? Where do you end up? Again, starting from the right side, proceeding to the left side of the heart. And if your puncture is inferior and anterior, you end up very close to the mitral valve. Uh, for most of the cases, this will not work. But for some uh, reverse chicken wing, this may be a good puncture. This is what you don't want. I think multiple speakers have stressed that. What if you do a superior and posterior puncture? Again, starting from the right side, ending up on the left side, your puncture is superior and posterior. So you're pretty high. It would be very difficult to reach the uh, appendage from this location. So this is the puncture we try to avoid. We, rare, we do not want to go through the PFO. I think this slide has also been shown before. So now we have learned about fossa of ballast, and then we have to figure out in our head the anatomy of uh, left atrial appendage. We don't have fluoroscopy image before making the puncture, but we do have T images. So those T images will correlate to fluoroscopy images. And the two important views, at least in my mind, there are three views which I'll show later on, 45, 90, and 135. 135 is what I call the money shot. You basically know the orientation of the appendage, how wide the appendage is, and the 45 degrees tells you the depth of the appendage. This is an interesting study published last year in Euro intervention by uh, Oli de Backer's group. And now these, these are CT scan images, so interior is on the right side of the picture, lateral view on a CT scan. So what they did were, basically the, for the amulet, it's the proximal orientation where your landing zone will be, that's important. Where does the wing end? It's a chicken wing ending on this way or the opposite side, that's not important. What's important is where the landing zone would be. If the landing zone, in abo above two examples, top uh, left and top right, are oriented anteriorly. Remember, this is again a CT scan images. On the bottom, there's a reverse chicken wing and a traditional chicken wing, but the lobe or the landing zone where the lobe will sit is heading posteriorly. So according to these authors, you can tailor your puncture based on the orientation of the lobe. This is another interesting uh, study from China, published earlier this year. They took about 850 reverse chicken wings, and then they uh, came out with this. Uh, you can see on the, this, all these patients got watchmen, actually, so that's why the watchman sheath is in picture. But to get an idea, if you are dealing with reverse chicken wing, it's always advantageous to use the blue sheath, the, where the blue sheath lies, which is an inferior puncture. And similarly, sometimes you have to tailor your puncture from anterior to posterior, depending on where the lobe would lie, where your landing zone would be. 
So coming to what is my approach to transeptal puncture with the amulet. In this example, you can see there is a 45 degree T view and uh, the opening is very small. The opening of the appendage is very small. So the first arrow, you don't want to, in 45 degree, what I look at is the length of the PV ridge or Coumadin ridge. If the ridge is too long, then definitely you don't want to come posterior because you will, your sheath will hit the ridge. You want to come little, mid, or anterior. And for 135, you can see, again, a very small opening. You want, if you come this way, uh, interior or mid, the mid portion would be better. In 90 degrees, what I look at, this is superior, this will be mid, this is inferior. So as you can see, the inferior puncture will be better. And here I've placed a model of uh, uh, amulet there, which fits in perfectly. So that was going, now, now looking at 135, what is my approach to TSP? The same example. The, in your mind, you have to envision how the lobe will sit. In this example, if you go in 135, very posterior, this is how the lobe will sit. You want a lobe to sit something like this, like what uh, we described, the previous speaker described, a partial chicken wing, a partial sandwich technique, or if you go interior, the lobe will sit like this. So you'll have to choose in your mind what you want to do, what you want to achieve, and then tailor your transeptal puncture according to envisioning in three dimension where you want your lobe to sit. Coming to some of the interesting cases, this patient is Charles Vassaris, a 384 year old male with multiple comorbidities. Looking at the uh, TE pictures, the first picture is a 45 degree. As you can see, the Kubadin ridge is not very prominent, so we won't run into any problems there. Then looking at uh, zero degrees and then looking at the picture on the bottom left, that blue arrow. So here I decide whether I'm going to go inferior or mid. So mostly inferior mid, like most of the speakers have said, inferior mid is the right answer for almost 80, 90% cases. So the arrow is pointing to where the lobe would sit, something like this. So inferior will be a good approach. And then you see a wide, shallow chicken wing, which, go, which is going anteriorly. So Initially, we thought we can do this with the watchman, but the watchman will leave, will leave a lot of gutter, as you can see. So amulet will be a good choice. And my approach here, in this case, would be inferior and mid. You can look at the angio. So as you can see, we ended up with uh, sandwich technique here, completely covering the lobe. And the disc is sitting very nicely. And once this was released, As you can see, nice closure of the appendage here. Coming to a different anatomy, 76-year-old gentleman with history of ischemic cardiomyopathy, very high chats fast score and high has blood score. So going to 90 degrees, which helps me to decide whether I will puncture superior, inferior, sorry, uh, superior, mid or inferior. Here, it shouldn't be a problem. If the lobe is sitting like this, I'll probably go mid here. Maybe not too inferior, inferior to mid. And then the Coumadin ridge is not very prominent in 45 degree, so I won't worry too much. But looking at this picture, if you look, this is a very shallow, posteriorly directed chicken wing. And I would want my device to be sitting, either it can sit like this, or this way, or third one. I think third one will be preferable because it's coming directly and completely closing the low as you can see in zero, there's a very shallow chicken wing. So we got the puncture at the right spot. As you can see, my sheath is right in the center, very coaxial. On the left side, you can see the triangle. So at every stage which we do, the way I do is I take a pause. I look at the ball, take a pause, do my clock or counter clock, and then triangle take a little pause, which is one or two second pause, and then gradually deploy the lobe. The lobe is sitting perfectly here. There's no leak, good closure, and that's the angiogram. Third patient, 83-year-old lady with Chad's Pass 5 and Hasblad 1. 
So here the anatomy is very different. If you look, it was very difficult to get adequate TE images. Patient has a very rotated heart. And if you look at the Coumadin ridge or the PV ridge, it's very, very prominent. It's almost extending to the mitral valve level. So here, you have to be very careful. You have to go inferior and a little anterior, mid to anterior. Otherwise, you'll run into this ridge. And before I puncture, I usually, one of the speakers described trajectory. I look I, on my transeptal needle. I basically modify my trajectory towards the opening of the appendage, as you can see there. It's pointing right towards the appendage opening. And then once the puncture is done, the Wurtz across wire falls right in the appendage and the appendage was closed without any problem. So this lady had a bilobed appendage which was very heavily pectinated with a very prominent PV ridge. With a good transeptal puncture, it was done in one shot, just one deployment, no recaptures. A patient number four, 68 year old male with multiple risk factors. So the problem with this patient was, as you can see in the images, it's a very shallow appendage. Plus, you can see a very prominent pulmonary, pulmonary artery there. Even in 45 degrees where you see the depth, there is almost no working depth. And if you look here, it's a very shallow, wide, almost like a funnel, very close to the pulmonary artery. And the second difficulty was it was very difficult to get a good image, traditional areocaudal view. Then we had to go extreme areocranial, which you can see on the bottom right will be our working. So we worked, we deployed the device in areocranial view. Sometimes you have to do that because RA coral traditionally was uh, foreshortening the appendage. To add to the complexity, there was a big PFO. And then again, tenting on the septum and the, se the trajectory is pointing towards the appendage. As you can see here, deployment there. It's close to the pulmonary artery. We were very careful here. No more, no recaptures. Single deployment. And once the disc was uh, released, as you can see, it's sitting very nicely. So what's interesting here is to get to see the separation, sometimes you have to go to extreme RAO. So here we have to go, if you look at the top, RAO 53 cranial 6. So an anesthesiologist who does the ET was almost hanging with her, with her probe like this because this is a very extreme angle. But here you can see very clearly that we have a great result with nice separation and sometimes you have to do that in these kind of twisted hearts. I think my f last case, this I did with the help of my EP colleague, a really challenging TSP. So 82 year old man who was referred for closure, he has a history of dextrocardia, prior bi bioprosthetic aortic valve replacement and a permanent pacemaker. To add to the complexity, the CT revealed there's interruption of IVC with uh, is, I guess, continuation. So th there is no way you can go from the IJ because of presence of pacemaker wire, which will interfere. So what we did was just to understand the anatomy better, we got a 3D model printed, and with the help of a mirror image, uh, we practiced the regular catheters because all your muscle memory you have to do clock or counter clock is totally opposite in dextrocardia. Then we asked a radiologist, an interventional radiologist, to help us get through the hepatic vein. The liver is on the left side here. So we went into the hepatic vein, the radiologist, and then found, entered into the uh, right atrium. The problem was the radiologist entered very, very laterally, almost in the axillary level. So as you can see, they're trying to find the right uh, vessel. Now that wire goes into the right atrium. With the help of an agilis, we were able to finally get a puncture. Once the uh, wire was in, then the procedure itself was easy. So to our knowledge, this was the first reported case of uh, using transhepatic access in a patient with, in, in a patient with dextrocardia and SIT. So left atrial appendage is still feasible in patients who have interrupted uh, I, IVC. You can come from the liver and do it, or sometimes you can come from the J IJ, as I think one of the operators had shown a case in the morning. In this complex anatomy, 3D printed model sometimes help. A transhepatic approach could be used for other cardiac intervention. So coming to the end of my talk, these are my numbers to those, to those operators who are beginning of their amulet implantation experience. So good transeptal puncture improves efficiency and workflow. So the commercial amulets, we started in December of 2021. These are my numbers I obtained from the company. 
average device time was more than 15 minutes. So as we learned, because Watchmen was totally different. After doing 500 Watchmen, we had to relearn for Amulet because it's the lobe which you want to sit in perfect, perfect position. So now the device time has come down to five minutes or less than five minutes. So at the end, proper TSP makes the procedure very efficient, quicker, and improves the chances of successful implantation. We have to aim being coaxial to the proximal part of the appendage, which is the landing zone. The rest of the shape of appendage doesn't really matter. Inferior mid-puncture works for most of them. Puncture made in bicable view, the proximal part is heading towards the apex in 90 degree view. Before puncturing, take a pause, look at the trajectory of the tenting. Is it pointing towards the opening of the appendage? If not, you can modify it and have a low threshold of repuncture. Thank you. So first of all, I would like just to thank um, Abbott um, for this kind invitation and, and actually the honor just to be participating in this first summit in, in US. So basically I'm gonna talk about device sizing, but you will see that device sizing, it's um, linked with many other factors. So um, we have just to keep in mind, you know, a whole bunch of factors just to have a good sizing and have good, um, you know, outcome, you know, with a, the with a device. And actually I'm gonna be talking about this um, five <clears throat> concepts and um, pre-planning, always with 3D imaging, optimal sizing, comparing the mean versus the maximum diameters. The concept that we have like a lobe and disc, so we need to measure both the landing and the ostium. Coaxial implantation, it's a key factor. And also the fact that I think that I look for more and more proximal implantations to try to cover it's the, the pulmonary reach. So first concept, a mean versus maximum diameters. On the left side, you have like a circular LAA where the mean diameter, it's very close to the um, maximum diameter, it's 24 and 23. Um, where we find like circular LAs, so in patients with long-standing LAs, patients, I would say older patients, sicker patients, probably the patients that probably we were treating um, more like five, six years ago, we're still facing these patients. But on the right side, I think that it's, you know, like the, the profile of patients that we're facing more and more. And are those patients in sign of rhythm and collapsing appendages, healthier patients where we're gonna find more and more elliptical appendage. And what's the problem with that? That the um, maximum diameter and the minimum diameter can be very different. So I mean, here we have a problem, you know, on sizing if we follow the current um, IFUs. So I'm going to show that with an example. So this is uh, like a regular case, a case that we did, where you can see um, a patient in sinus rhythm, like a small appendage, and super collapsing appendage. So we like just to do um, 3D echo, and we, as I told you, we measure the ostium and we measure the, the landing zone. In this case, we can see that the ostium was extremely elliptical, 22 by 10. And the landing area was also very, very, very elliptical, so 18 by nine. So in this case, you know, here you can see, um, you know, cranial and then caudal, how it's collapsing and the difference between, you know, one plane and the, and the other. So it's a challenging appendage. So in this specific case that we said that in the landing area, we have like 19, nine, and a mean diameter of 14 or 30.5. If we follow the current amulet IFU, I say that this is a patient that we're facing more and more. So they're gonna tell us to use amulet 22. But of course, you know, I, I would say that all of us here would agree that that would be crazy because we're gonna double, you know, like the size of the minimum diameter and this appendage will never fit an amulet 22. So here, you know, there's a, a, a novel matrix that, well, there's a paper, but this might be complex, but the concept of this matrix, it's extremely easy. Means, you know, use the mean diameter and then oversize by four and six. And that's it, I mean, that's the, the matrix, there's no secret on that. It's just, instead of using the maximum, we use the mean. And the only rule, it's that never go smaller than the maximum diameter. So in this case, it's telling us, you know, we apply four millimeters um, compared to the mean diameter, it would be an 18. So the 18 is good, yes, because it's not um, smaller than the maximum diameter. So in this extremely, um, say, challenging appendage, we make things easy, you know, because um, we have like a, like a direct and easy answer. 
So that's what we did, like go with an amulet, and go coaxial, go proximal, and it was like a two minute implant because we don't, we don't have just to change anything here. You can see we have the triangle configuration. I like just to go very slowly as you show, you know, like in all, all the cases, and then you end up, you know, like with an easy procedure in a challenging appendage. What happened here that, you know, like you change your mind. So in a sense, you're trying to compensate um, you know, like an internal thinking with this, um, that, you know, like um, it's always there and in elliptical appendages might be, might be difficult if it's not standardized. Second concept, um, measure both, you know, the ostium and the landing zone. So here's a, a draw that I always keep because it's courtesy of Dr. Lam and I like it. And, and here it shows that with the same landing zone, 20, so maybe we need to change, you know, like the size of the device. In the first one, you know, maybe a 22 that will probably, you know, like just fit and will be stable. It's not enough. And, you know, like, and I would, of course, use a 25, you know, just to have a larger disc. And on the right side, probably a 25, the disc will be too much and we're gonna have interaction with the pulmonary bridge and we're gonna have interaction with the mitral. So in these cases of you know, similar um, landing zones, we're gonna use different devices. So this is another concept that you know, like makes you know, the amulet completely, completely different. And I'm gonna show with this another case that this is a, a catalyst case that honestly like, was very difficult. So this is not for me, this is not a appendage with two lobes. This is a patient with two appendages. You know, because um, actually, you know, I don't see any, you know, common, you know, landing area proximal part. I only see two appendages here. So we found that, you know, with the catalyst, I mean, we were like super happy to find this, you know, complex anatomy, challenging anatomy in a patient within, you know, such an important protocol. But well, we had to proceed. So we measure and we measure, you know, the largest um, lobe that it was the inferior lobe and it was 10 by eight. So meaning that probably, you know, 16 millimeter was the election. You know, it was the smallest um, amulet that we had. And then the ostium was um, 17 by 12, meaning that um, something, you know, larger than 18, 20 probably would be, would be enough. But then, you know, comes, you know, and Chris Ellis told about, you know, these two brain thing, you know, the brain from the landing and the brain from the ostium. It's not that easy. It's not that easy, that case. Because if we put the device in the inferior lobe, as we said before, the central pin, it's gonna be on the lower part. So it means it's not gonna be in the center. So then we have to measure, you know, and from this um, inferior lobe, you know, half of the disc is gonna be down and half of the disc is gonna be up. So you, you can see here, so you have like the central pin is gonna be here. So then we have to measure how much of this we're gonna need here just to be covering this second lobe and then, you know, like the same thing, you know, how much we're gonna need, you know, like, um, and we're not touching the mitral valve. So in this case was around, you know, 10 and 10. So it means that, you know, like in the position that we were anticipating, so it was not 17, it was 20. So that means that amulet 16, it's 22, it would be probably too tight. So maybe amulet 18 was a better um, option. And here I make a proposal, <laughs> Greg, because I think that um, we should change the name of the, of the devices. Um, why don't we call, you know, instead of uh, AMLET 16, why don't we call them 16 by 22? So this way we're gonna focus and we wanna highlight the concept that, you know, it's a two-part um, device and, you know, like um, we're gonna, you know, without saying anything specific, we're gonna make this more important. So in this case, we select the AMLET M18 and um, knowing that it would be a little bit oversized just to have, you know, a 24 disc and, you know, have the ability to cover, you know, the full ostium considering that, you know, like the central pill was going down. So the implant was, again, a lot of thinking before. I like just to think a lot before I go into the lab. I like just to think a lot before I choose you know, the device and then makes things easier inside the lab. So here you can see that you know, the lobe at the beginning was not covered, but then after pulling back, we were able to cover the pulmonary ridge and of course you know, covering you know, this upper appendage 
um, in, a, in a proper way. So here you can see how we release it, and that's the final result. And again, you make like a super complex appendage by measuring, you know, and very in an accurate way, you know, uh, you make like a difficult or challenging procedure in an easy one. Third concept, coaxial implantation. Okay, here it's the tool and FIOPS. I love FIOPS. You know, they're gonna, you know, anticipate the final result. We can see, you know, how, you know, like the device is gonna look. But, you know, to get the results, we need to be coaxial. I mean, if we're not coaxial because we have like a bad transeptal, that's, gonna not, that's not gonna be possible. So, it's like parking. So, definitely, you know, if we have, you know, like this car, and instead of a car, we have an amulet, if we're facing like this, we're gonna struggle. I mean, it's gonna be much more difficult to go this way than to go this way. So that's why I strongly encourage, you know, just to go back to the steerable catheter. And my suggestion would be just to use steerable catheter always just to try to avoid, you know, like any, any coaxiality because sometimes it's difficult to anticipate if you're gonna be coaxial or not. And I don't like to change shifts. Another concept, um, coaxiality and be proximal. So in this case, in this case, it's like more or less like a standard case, like the landing zone would be like the mean around 24. So in this case, we went for an amulet 28. Doesn't look like a very difficult appendage. So that was the ball. I, am, I like to inject just to see the orientation, not to measure, just to see the, the orientation. And here, you know, we end up with a reasonable um, result where you can see that the, the lobe is stable and the disc is also stable. But then we check echo, and then you know, you see that the that the reach it's you know like inside the sorry, the, the disc it's inside the reach. So we try just to pull back and it was not holding. So what we do, we upsize, we went for a 31, and then you know we have like a longer disc or we change the orientation. So in this case, we try, you know, like this second option. So if we change the orientation of the device, you know, then, and we're proximal, then again, the central pin of the device is gonna be center, and we're gonna be able to cover from the center, you know, like the, 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 the ostium, you know, like in a complete way. So if you compare one implant and the other, here it's like the reach is completely covered. So um, same device, more or less same landing zone, but one it's completely coaxial and the other it's not coaxial. And look, you know, like the difference, you know, in results. So the second one, you know, on the right, it's much better. It's just only a matter of turning counterclockwise. So proximal, coaxial, so these are, you know, like, um, I would say like crucial factors for, um, you know, like um, a good and, you know, like appropriate result. Finally, you know, this is something that we, that we publish, and actually I think that now, you know, we have more and more um, data supporting, you know, the fact of being proximal and the fact of covering the PR, or the pulmonary reach. It's true that it's not always possible um, to close, to cover this pulmonary reach, but if you see, you know, like on the lower part, if we're gonna cover the pulmonary reach, the rate of DRT, it's gonna be super low. So in a sense, this is the only modifiable factor, the only modifiable factor that we have so far to modulate DRT, apart from the, of course, the antithrombotic treatment, but this is like something not related with the, with the procedure. There are many features, characteristics of the patients, like, I don't know, echo contrast, size of the left atrium, diabetes, low ejection fraction, and valvular disease that are not modifiable and are gonna increase. But that's the only factor that we need or we have and we can modulate. So I think that it's really important to look for this PR coverage and try just to make these, you know, tiny movements, this pre-planning to try to get this result. And actually, you know, I'm going back, you know, to the first slide that I like just to pre-plan. And of course, you know, you saw that I like much more mean than maximum diameters because actually, you know, when you have like easy appendages, the maximum and the mean diameter are gonna be the same. And then, you know, when you have like a challenging one, it's when the mean, it's gonna be more important and you're more useful. Measure both landing zone and ostium, coaxial implantation and proximal implantation. And actually have a last case. Do I have time? Yes, yes I have. So, and it's like a, I would say like a very extreme case, a, a little bit strange as well. 
In it's a patient with a mechanical mitral valve, you know, a, a stroke despite optimal anticoagulation, of course, with coumadin, warfarin, whatever. In, in, in Europe, we have more coumadin. Here, you have more warfarin. Um, severe tricuspid regurgitation, thrombus in the appendage. And it's a patient that underwent, you know, like a tricuspid repair with triclip. And, and we underwent, you know, like the appendage occlusion with embolic protection. In this case, we use a, a triguard. Look at the appendage, well, this is the mechanical, well, sorry, this is the tricuspid regurgitation that we treat, you know, with, you know, like triclip, and we were happy about that, but that's not, you know, like the aim of the, of the talk, and here you see the, the appendage, okay, this is what it is, I mean, and actually here, I think that, I don't know if that appendage, because there was no note, but I don't know if they try, you know, like when they put the mitral valve, they try to, you know, like suture and then it opened. Because what it's a little bit strange that, you know, the ostium, it's very narrow, and then, you know, you have like a huge appendage. So in this case, um, and, you know, going to the point that we like to measure the landing zone and the ostium, here the problem was the opposite that if you put a device that fits the ostium, sorry, that fits the landing zone, then the ostium is gonna be massive and it's gonna interfere with a mitral mechanical valve. So then you have a problem. On the other hand, we believe that put, you know, like just a massive, you know, like a huge um, watchman flex here um, would be dangerous because we have a lot of thrombus and we didn't want just to, you know, occupy, occupy all, the, all the appendage. So this is what we did. I'm going to show you the the the, well, the measurements. It was the landing zone was maximum diameter 32, minimum 24, mean of uh, 28, and then the Austin was. Massive. I think in the U.S. I will send it to Europe. <laughs> <laughs> Surgical. <laughs> so David, what would you do? Watchman, I mean amulet. I mean watchman would be fine, but I would use an amulet by preference. Yes. Okay. So well. I'll show you what we did. So we put an amulet 34, but here the problem, again, you know, like brain, you know, on the lobe and brain, you know, on the disc. Here the problem is the disc. So what we do, or what, what we did, it just put, you know, the disc, you know, inside, you know, this huge ostium. So we try to go a little bit deeper and we did that because otherwise you can see that, you know, if you put it outside, it was like touching the, the mechanical valve. And again, it was like a, quite an easy procedure. There was not much of an elbow, but again, since the patient is gonna be on Coumadin, you know, the fact of giving or leaving, you know, like a small elbow or a small, you know, angulation there, it's not a big concern because it's probably, you know, like uh, the risk of having a thrombus there with the Coumadin, it's gonna be lower. So you can be much more forgiving in a patient, well, taking Coumadin forever, anticoagulation forever in terms of DRT. And that's it, thank you. And good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to change the theme a little. I'm going to talk about what could potentially be a competitive therapy to the left atrial appendage occlusion device. Now, I hope that I will show you that that is probably not true. But let's see how we go. First of all, I'd like to show you some data about the so-called direct oral anticoagulants or novel oral anticoagulants, data that comes from an FDA-mandated study, a large registry. It's a comparison between warfarin and three of the DOACs, dobigatran, rivaroxaban, and apixaban, and you can see their colors. And we see outcomes of thromboembolic stroke, intracranial hemorrhage, major extracranial bleeding, and death. Now, it's true that there is a clear reduction in thromboembolic stroke. There's also a reduction in intracranial hemorrhage. With major extracranial bleeding, it's not so clear. There's a reduction with a pixaban, but there is an increase with uh, uh, rivaroxaban and more or less the same with dobigatran. When we come to death, again, there seems to be a significant reduction with DOAC therapy. So three cheers for DOACs. But of course, what matters is the residual risk. 
which you see on the right, there's still a risk of at least 1% per annum of thromboembolic stroke, about half a percent for intracranial hemorrhage, major extracranial bleeding between 1% and 3% per annum, and a death rate of about 2% per annum. So that sets the scene for us, and I think we all understand that there are ongoing complications with anticoagulant drugs. Some of these complications are more common with vitamin K antagonists, and others are more common with the DOAC drugs, but they do exist. Now, these problems are the reason why left atrial appendage occlusion does offer to close unmet medical needs. But the world of anticoagulation is on the change. You'll recall that heparin and the vitamin K antagonists were introduced at the beginning of the Second World War. The so-called thrombin inhibitors began to be introduced in 1990, and Dabigatran, for example, was approved in 2008. There were, after that, a number of factor 10A inhibitors, ranging from apixaban, edoxaban, and batrixaban, and rivaroxaban. Now, however, we see some new people on the block, and they are the so-called factor 11A inhibitors. And these are milvexian, asandexian, and abalasimab for the most part. Now, let's uh, look at why these factor 11A inhibitors are potentially interesting. I think we all learned at some stage in our life parts of the coagulation cascade. And it hasn't really changed, except our understanding of the cascade has changed a little. You can see on this image that there are two parts of the coagulation cascade. One part is responsible for hemostasis, which is thought of as a physiological phenomenon, and another part is responsible for thrombosis, which is thought of as a pathological phenomenon. So we can, I think, begin to look at these two pathways independently. And the pathway which is of particular interest with regard to bleeding is the so-called extrinsic pathway, and the thrombosis pathway is the intrinsic pathway. Well, let's have a look at these two pathways. On the left, you see the extrinsic pathway. Why is it called the extrinsic pathway? It's because it relates to events outside the lumen of the vessel. It mostly relates to tissue factor activating factor seven in the adventitia of the vascular system. Now this is responsible for causing the wound in the vasculature to heal. In other words, to create hemostasis. On the right-hand side, you see the intrinsic pathway, and this is uh, related to thrombosis, again stimulated in part by tissue factor. But importantly, this pathway starts with factor 12 and goes through factor 11 and onwards to the joint part of the pathway and eventually to produce thrombosis. Now, you see that there is a feedback loop on the right hand or intrinsic pathway. Thrombin activates factor 11 or amplifies the response of factor 11. And if there is a lot of thrombin within the vasculature, this feedback is very strong, particularly if the intrinsic pathway has already been activated. So you can see there's a feedback loop that means that thrombosis will develop quite readily. Now, in order to deal with this, we have a number of choices 
of anticoagulants. And I put the four main categories on this slide. From the left, they are heparins, vitamin K antagonists, DOAX, and factor XI inhibitors. And you'll see at the bottom the effect on bleeding and the effect on thrombosis. Now, all of them are antithrombotic. Heparins inhibit factor 10A and factor 2A and are responsible for a lot of bleeding. But vitamin K antagonists affect not only factor 10 and factor 2, but also 7 and 9, and are responsible for even more bleeding. The DOACs, on the other hand, affect either factor 10A or factor 2, and the bleeding is less. But you can see the effect on thrombosis or against thrombosis is maintained. Now, if you move to factor 11 inhibitors on the right-hand side, you can see that this only affects factor 11 and or factor 11A. And that feedback loop is eliminated because of the inhibition of factor 11, which is stimulated otherwise by the thrombin developing in the thrombosis within the vessel. Now, how do we know the effect of a factor 11 inhibitor? We know it because we can measure the APTT, the activated partial thromboplastin time. And you can see that as the dose increases, as the plasma concentration of these drugs increase, the APTT increases. And this is the way in the clinic that these measurements are made. On the right-hand side, you can see with the, these data from Milvexin that there is no dose-related increase in bleeding, which is an important observation. Now, let's um, have a look at what kind of factor 11A inhibitors there are. They are antibodies or small molecules or natural inhibitors or antisense oligonucleotides or so-called aptamers. Of these particular varieties, only three are being developed clinically. The antisense oligonucleotides prevent the synthesis of factor 11A. Now, if it prevents the synthesis, obviously it's going to take some time to act. So it's rather slow. And its activity is going to be rather prolonged when you stop the drug. But it's not going to be vulnerable to uh, renal excretion difficulties or hepatic metabolism or drug-drug interactions. Now, the next variety that is being developed are small molecules. Now, these small molecules act rapidly within minutes or hours, and they stop with an elimination half-life around something of the order of 10 to 20 hours. So, basically, they have to be given daily. They are potentially vulnerable to renal elimination difficulties, to SIP metabolism problems, and to drug-drug interactions. The final category are monoclonal antibodies, which bind with the target protein. They can be given intravenously or subcutaneously, but not orally. They're given on a monthly basis. They act fairly rapidly uh, within hours to days, and the offset is also slow, allowing the monthly administration. And they're not vulnerable to renal elimination, SIP metabolism, or drug-drug interactions. Now, we're beginning to see the results of studies with the factor 11A inhibitors in the journals. For example, the first one consisted of uh, an, a study with uh, knee and hip surgery looking at DVT with an antisense oligonucleotide. 
The next was with Milvexian, again looking at venous thromboembolism, and this is a small molecule. The next was with abalasimab for the prevention of venous thrombosis, and this is a monoclonal antibody. And finally, we had a study in atrial fibrillation with the small molecule, which is known as asandexin. Now, this is that small study. Note first that it only lasted 12 weeks. Secondly, that the study is relatively small. Three limbs of 250 patients in each limb, 50 milligrams a day of asyndexin or 20 milligrams uh, tablets per day or a pixaban. And the primary purpose of the study was simply to look at bleeding endpoints, although they also took the opportunity to look at the quantification of factor 11A inhibition. And they did an exploratory analysis in terms of ischemic events. There were very few ischemic events, but you can see that the effect on bleeding was marked. If you look at the green bars, this is the all bleeding. And if you look at the darker blue bars towards the left, this is ISTH major bleeding or clinically relevant non-major bleeding. In fact, there were no ISTH bleeds whatsoever. So these are all clinically relevant non-bleeding. Uh, and you can see that uh, the bleeding endpoints of this type were at least halved by the use of asyndexin in comparison with the Pixaban, which is the least hemorrhagic of the DOAC drugs. Now, as I've said, no major bleeding with asyndexin whatsoever. Now, we have some ongoing trials in atrial fibrillation, and these are of two types. One is a trial which is a large trial, about 20,000 patients, which will last for about 30 to 36 months. And it's a comparison between a factor 11 inhibitor and a DOAC drug. All done in patients, of course, at risk of stroke, but not particularly at risk of hemorrhage. The second type of study is a smaller study. It's a factor 11 or 11A inhibitor versus placebo. This means only about 2,000 patients are needed and could be over in 20 to 30 months. This involves patients who for some reason are not suitable for anticoagulation with approved anticoagulants. So in other words, a population which is fairly similar to the population that may receive a left atrial appendage occlusion device. Now, if we actually look at the studies, you can see them uh, tabulated here. There are two ongoing with abalasimab, one with milvexin, and three with asyndexin. I've told you about the Pacific AF study, and you can see that with all three uh, drugs, there are studies in atrial fibrillation. In two of the cases, mil milvexin and asyndexin, there are these large studies in all comers of AF patients at risk. And with abalasimab and asyndexin, there's a trial in patients at risk of stroke, but also not suitable for conventional oral anticoagulation. So to return to my slide about the problems with anticoagulation, we've noted that some of these problems are more common with vitamin K antagonists and others with NOACs. But what about the problem with factor 11 inhibitors? Does it solve any of this? Well, the enthusiasts would say that it solves almost all of this. The only thing, of course, is we haven't the faintest idea whether they're effective in atrial fibrillation patients at all. We have simply no data. But I also think that all these problems remain to some extent with some of these drugs, certainly bleeding, will occur with any kind of molecule or any formulation that interferes with coagulation. 
It's true, we probably don't need expensive reversal agents with the short-acting compounds, but what about the monoclonal antibodies or the antisense oligonucleotides, which are very long-acting? And all of these other problems will occur with small molecules. So my view is that, yes, activated factor 11 is a promising target for antithrombotic agents. That factor 11 or 11A inhibition acting on the intrinsic pathway is not going to interfere much with hemostasis. That there are several strategies for inhibition of factor 11 or 11A, and these drugs are being considered in atrial fibrillation. We only have one small trial with no efficacy data of any relevance in atrial fibrillation, and we have ongoing trials with three of these agents. So the indications for factor 11, 11A inhibitors may be similar to those for left atrial appendage closure, but we have still a long way to go, but not so long that we can be entirely comfortable about it. For example, some of these studies will conclude before, for example, the catalyst study concludes. And that's a very important consideration. Thank you very much.